who knows what's around the corner? Who knows what like tomorrow brings? Like buy the shoes, enjoy the shoes, go mm-hmm. out dancing in them, go have a fun time, go out for dinner with your girlfriends, make everybody look at them, turn some heads, <laughs> like have some fun. All right, Brad, welcome to Richer Lives. Thank you. I gotta tell you, I'm excited to talk. You got an extensive resume, you know, celeb stylist. You're a judge on Canada's Drag Race. Excited to dive into this, so let's get started. Before we get into all of the fun, this is the part of the show where I tell you that myself and our guest, Brad Goreski, are non-client promoters of SoFi Wealth, LLC, and everybody you'll hear from today has been compensated by SoFi for their time. And I'll tell you that I'm a registered representative with SoFi Securities, LLC, and an investment advisor representative with SoFi Wealth, LLC. In every episode of Richer Lives, it's my job to make sure that nothing said is false or misrepresents the truth around investing. Nicely done. So before we get to the really juicy gossip that I'm going to grill you on, okay, I want to let the viewers get to know you a little bit better. Cool. And so we're going to do an icebreaker. Don't think too hard about this. Okay. You have to pick one wardrobe category to purchase on a budget for the rest of your life. Which category? Um, underwear. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Because I'm... Oh, I'm wearing Tom Ford underwear right now. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, so that yeah, was like $80 that's... a pair? <laughs> so that's like real, yeah. yeah. You know, there's a mix of underwear in my drawer. <laughs> okay. From what? Tom Ford all the mm. way down to like not Tom Ford. Okay. Another quick question. Mm-hmm. What's a piece that's been trending lately that you're like, mm, the price tag mm. is not justified, does not match? You know, uh, sometimes I think like we're getting the wheels are off the cart a little bit with how much like a sweatshirt is now. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like a sweatshirt. I'm from Canada. So like flannels are a big thing. They always have been. And there have been a few instances where I've been like shopping online and I'm looking at a flannel and I'm like, how is this $750? Like they were like 19. Yes. If I want a flannel, I'm literally just going to Brian's house and stealing one. I'm going to come to Brian. Michigan, okay. Oh, do, uh, yeah. So you know the vibe. Canada, right? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably like, I think the athleisure wear right now is getting crazy expensive. Okay, well, don't come for athleisure. That's. Athleisure that is, is great, poison. but when like a sweatsuit's costing you, you know, two grand. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's fair. like a little. Fair, 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 fair. Yeah, it's a little dicey. All right, let's get right into the good stuff. I have some juicy questions because I'll be honest, um, I started creating content roughly two and a half years ago and styling is something that's relatively new to me. Can you just like walk us through really quickly like how red carpet styling even works? It's actually a much longer process than what people think. The way it starts is we get a request from our client, somebody from their team saying they're going to whatever event. And then from there, my clients kind of like me to go full steam ahead Mm -hmm. um, and pull basically what I'm kind of feeling for the moment, unless they have like a clear direction, like I want to wear red or I'd like to do something glamorous or whatever. That's a lot of trust. Yeah. I mean, there are different other stylists who will do like mood boards and like collab and do all kinds of stuff. But I kind of just like take the reins and then Mm -hmm. show my client in the fitting. But the way that it it works is once I get the request, then I do um, research uh, on the collections, basically for which designers I think are going to be appropriate for my client for this event. I reach out to them. I usually send them selects of what I like from their collection. Pray that I at least get one of them. Um, If not, then they give us subs, which are substitutes. And then uh, I put a rack or two of clothing together. My client comes in. I fit it on them with the seamstress there because everything has to be altered. Then, you know, we usually pick something within the first five dresses. After that, I get the jewelry, bag. Shoes are usually decided in the fitting. And then we make red carpet magic. I love that. And here's the biggest thing that I did not know because I literally attempted to thieve something off of set, you have to give it back. For the most part. Yes. If you get a gown custom made, yeah. most of the time the designer will give the gown as a gift to the client. Oh, wonderful. Uh, which is nice. Or if it's kind of like a big red carpet moment for the celebrity and for the designer, a lot of the times they will gift the gown. Mm-hmm. And there are also some people who I work with who the designers know the client's just gonna Mm -hmm. like keep the gown. (laughs) 
Just take it. Yeah, like you. Yeah, you would yeah. be that person. You guys, but it's, it's not legal advice. Yeah, but most of the time, I will say, most of the time, the clothes go back, which is a, a an odd system, yeah. but it's, it's just the system in place. But the great part is that moment where you find the gown or the outfit, and then on top of that, when it all comes together with hair and makeup and jewelry, and you see your client, like, so in love with all the work that you've put into it, it's like the best feeling. What's the look you're most proud of? Oh, wow. I know, that's like a hard one. Pick your favorite kid. <laughs> well, the, I think the one early on in my career that kind of uh, was one I was really proud of, and I know one Jessica really loved, was Jessica Alba went to the Golden Globes. I saw this Oscar de la Renta dress in their pre-fall collection, and um, I texted my friend at Oscar and I was like, I have to have this gown. Like, yeah. what do I, how do I get it? Like, and she was like, I'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> and I got the gown, I tried it on Jessica and she loved it. And then I got a, I think it was a six and a half million dollar, oh, it was so good. Six and a half million dollar Harry Winston diamond mm -hmm. necklace that they, released from like, I mean, it was like a whole thing a getting vault. it. Yeah. And there were like guards with her all night, but it was oh. just, and then she carried an ostrich feather bag, like this feather bag that was kind of in the same palette. The gown was coral and she did like Veronica Lake waves. And she was like one of the first people to do a matching lip that her um, makeup artist, Lauren Anderson did. And it was just like, I remember her telling me that JLo had said to her in line, like, girl, like you got the dress kind of thing, like loved her look. And I was like, mm. oh, that's like everything. <laughs> and I remember going to a party afterwards and like everybody was like, damn, like you killed it with Jessica. And it was like one of the first times on my own that I was like, I'm like doing it, yeah. you know, like it's like happening. I can yeah. feel it happening. And Jessica was just like such a great, we had so much fun together and did so many looks, but that one for me is one that I still look back on and it felt like quintessential Brad Goreski style. Mm. Just like sexy, sophisticated and like glamorous. I got like chills from you telling that story. <laughs> also, I, I probably got chills from the six and a half million dollar Harry Winston oh, it diamond. Was, it was such a good night. This is like such a nice walk down memory lane for me. Yeah, it was, it was something else. It was fun. There've been a lot of those though mm. since then like stepping off the red carpet. Like for normal people, I feel like it's just kind of a balancing act between, okay, what's the look I, I want, the confidence I'm gonna have in that look with staying in budget. So like, what are ways that people can do that and actually stay in that budget? Well, when I was a kid, we, my mom would give us two options. One was we could go and shop retail and get like a few things before mm -hmm. back to school, or we could wait until back to school already started, and then we would get to go to the sales and get more mm. stuff. So I was always kind of taught that buying things on sale, you would get more things mm -hmm. and more options. And I'm all about options. So my suggestion is now, there are so many ways online to get discount codes to like, you know, get email blasts for sales. Um, you know, now we used to have to go to the outlets. Now the outlets are just online. Um, so I think like, you know, I think you should always wait for the sale always wait for the sale. Almost everything goes on sale, a fraction, even if it's 20%. Mm -hmm. People now put together like the look for less as well, which mm -hmm. kind of used to be not a good thing, mm -hmm. but now it's like, I also do the same thing. Like I don't wanna spend $10,000 on jeans, a shirt and a blazer. Like I would rather put that look together, but in a way that is, I'm not going to feel buyer's remorse about it. Okay, before we keep going, let's take a quick break to talk about my favorite thing that SoFi offers. Brian, one thing I will keep talking about until the day I die is a high yield savings account. It's just so, so important. It really is, and it has to check a lot of boxes. Especially the high yield box, because you wanna earn more money on your money. And no account fees. That's always a plus. And there's always getting your paycheck up to two days early. And extra FDIC insurance up to $2 million through a network of participating banks. Exactly. Check out SoFi.com slash Richer Lives to open a SoFi checking and savings account and start reaching your financial goals. All right, so you started your career at the same time, you know, getting into TV. And doing one of those things would be very, very challenging. But doing 
both, I imagine, would be especially challenging. Can you start by giving us a little background on how that got started and how balancing both things either helped or hurt each of them individually? I thrive when I'm doing multiple things at once, which is why I'm so grateful that I've kind of had this 360 career of like, styling, being on TV, and then when I was doing the red carpet, talking about the styling. So I was like doing this full circle of like styling people, being on TV, and then being on TV, talking about styling people. So it kind of worked out to this great thing that was perfect for my personality. In terms of the actual being on camera and being filmed, learning a job at the same time, I didn't have any kind of markers for either thing. So okay. I didn't know what it was like to be working for a stylist because she was my, actually she was my first, my second job as an assistant to a stylist, but obviously there were no cameras the first time. Um, and then the cameras were just kind of like there following us. So for people who watch the show, they see a very real depiction of what it was like as a person starting off a new job and being filmed because there were a lot of things that happened on camera that were just 1000% what was happening in the moment. So they would be with us for hours a day. I mean, like a full 10, 12 hour day, just waiting for stuff to go down. Um, we would literally just be on our like computers, like typing away and then some disaster would happen. And obviously they would be really happy and I would not be really happy because <laughs> I would have to deal with it in real life. Yeah. And they were just like, oh, this will be great for the sizzle reel or the trailer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I know how it works now. Um, but in the moment, I wasn't really like, I was so wanting to be a good assistant. I remember the first, after the show had started airing and we went to our first fashion week, I was like, what is happening? Like our car is like surrounded by people who are trying to get to us. And I'm just like on my Blackberry trying to get clothes for Kate Hudson. It was like really a strange thing happening at the same time as being the assistant to a very busy stylist. It was like the work had to get done. Yeah. Can I ask, cause I'm so nosy, how much did you make your very first year being an assistant and was it a lot of money? I made basically like a normal wage. It wasn't a ton of money. It wasn't little money, but it was, I didn't care, to be yeah. honest. I really wanted to be, to learn the skill. I grew up in a small town in Canada and then to be in LA and working with like the biggest celebrities at the time mm -hmm. with the biggest stylist at the time, it was literally like a boot camp for styling. I mm. learned so much there. It was like a real case of fake it till you make it. You can see on the show when I messed up, like I did not really know what I was doing. Like I was <laughs> learning it on TV. And then I learned it more on TV when I left Rachel and I had my own show and I was like working out of my garage. And I was like, now what do I do, <laughs> you know? I don't have an agent, I don't have any clients. Like I'm just kind of here. Can you tell us, you know, a lot of the viewers are probably interested in, you know, starting their own careers and really getting into it. Like, what was the biggest mistake you ever made? Spending too much money. On what? Shipping. Really? I spent so much money on shipping. How much? Like upwards of $40,000. On shipping? Yeah. It's wow. a big, like all any stylist who's watching right now is like, yeah. I mean, that's part mm. of the thing is it's getting the clothes to the client, a lot of the time the, the design houses will pay for it. Sometimes they'll split it, but there are a lot of people who just like won't cover shipping. But mm. shipping was a big part of it, yeah. It was So what would you have done differently? I, to be honest, I didn't have a business plan. <laughs> okay. Full transparency, like yeah. I just didn't have, I was just willing to kind of do whatever it took to like, Jessica Alba was my first client on my own and I was just willing to do whatever it took to get her the best clothes for the look because I knew that my investment in what people were seeing me do would obviously get other work, which yeah. it did. I mean, it's been 13 or 14 years since I started my own business and it's still like, I'm like, wow, I'm still like doing, this is like a long time to have your own thing, yeah. which I'm really proud of because I'm not, I mean, I'm a creative, I'm not necessarily business minded, but then also I've been able to kind of have a styling business, a TV career, like a bunch of other things just by kind of 
wanting more for myself, you know? And like, the other thing is, is just never giving up. Mm -hmm. You know, like things ebb and flow. You're like at the top sometimes, you're like in the middle other times. And it's like, you have to, like it never stops. Yeah. Like people, I think sometimes people are like, oh, well I've made it. It's like, well, what's, I've made it to yeah. you. You know, because there's still like, I'm still constantly like reinventing. I'm still constantly trying to beat the last red carpet I did, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just the way that I am, but you cannot stop. If it's the thing that you want and the place that you want to be in, you have to continue to fight to be there. Success is rented, not bought. Yes! <laughs> um, you know, you're obviously doing all of this, like Brian mentioned earlier, like you're styling, you're on TV, you're on TV talking about styling. like. What advice do you have for people who are trying to manage a bunch of goals all at once? Like my husband said to me when I wanted to intern, he was like, what are the, I wanted to intern at a fashion magazine. He was like, well, where do you, where is the number one place you want to go? And I'm like, Vogue. Duh. And he was like, well, let's start there, you know, mm -hmm. and then work our way down the list if we don't get in there. Luckily, I got into Vogue and I got to have the New York office experience and like get into town cars and go up to Harry Winston and pick Fancy. up $20 million necklaces. And during that time, I got to do all of that stuff. But I would say like, go after the one thing that you think will be the core because the styling is the core of my business. Right. Right. Everything kind of springs off of that, of the fashion expertise comes from there. And so that for me has always been kind of the thing that I go back to. When I'm not doing a TV show, I always have the styling and the styling is has luckily for me always been consistent. It's also be good at all the things you're doing yeah. is the other thing. <laughs> you can do a lot of different things, but like be good at all of them. When you're there doing that thing, be really good at it. Be really present, give your all. You know, there's a, a there's a, a saying that I kind of live by, which is give a dime, take a nickel, go okay. in there okay. and like give everything you've got to the okay. thing. The money will kind of like sort out itself mm -hmm. in a way. I've kind of been a believer in that. Not really going after as much as I love the cash and prizes and I've gotten a lot of those is doing something that makes me happy, that I'm excited yeah. to go to every day. I'm excited to go to my styling studio. I'm excited to go to set. I'm excited to see my clients. You know, I don't think I've really dreaded a day of work. I mean, I'm sure there are days, but for the most part, I wake up and I'm like, what dress am I getting today? <laughs> Who's gonna have responded with confirmations? What jewelry am I gonna pull today? Like, I'm always kind of excited by something. That feels like ultimate happiness to be able to wake up every single day and like, be excited to do your job, that's awesome. I just, I wanted, once I interned at Vogue and I was around those editors and I was around all those clothes and I got to go on set and I felt that thing where I was like, this is where I wanna be. I feel alive in this arena. I didn't know if I quite fit in. I remember saying, I saw an editor who I'm still friendly with in the elevator in the Condé Nast building in Times Square at the time. And she looked like really stressed out. And I was like, oh, you, you look like stressed out. I don't know why an intern is saying this to an editor, but she's like, oh, I've got this shoot this weekend and I don't have anybody to help me and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I'll help you. And I went on set with her and she was like, you were great. Like I had no idea what I was doing. And I just kind of like did busy stuff and helped her out. And so she told other editors and then I got asked to go on mm. other things. And Come so on. I got to do things when I was an intern. Like I got to be on set with Jake Gyllenhaal. I got to do like ad campaigns and they taught me things that I passed down to all of my assistants and interns, which is like how to act on set, how to steam clothes properly. I once had Grace Coddington tell me, um, I was on a Vogue shoot and I was steaming this Donna Karen dress and she had checked in on it and I was like, a lot of ruffles and I was like doing it, doing it, doing it. And she came over to me and she was like, you breathe new life into this dress after I steamed wow. it. And I was like, oh my God, like, does life get any better? <laughs> so many weird things have happened to me along the way and they continue to happen where I'm like, why am I here, you know? It's so strange. Destiny. I guess so. Okay, I know we're on a roll here, but let's take a quick pause to learn about my favorite SoFi benefit. Brian, what's the number one mistake you see people make with their finances? I'd have to say thinking they have to go about it alone. Like, you wouldn't expect to be a celebrity stylist like Brad Goreski doing it entirely on your own. So why would you have that expectation for something like your personal finances? That's a really good point. So what do you recommend? 
meet with a financial planner, of course, like myself. We can help guide you and give you personalized advice to your unique financial situation. And if you're a SoFi member, you'll get access to financial planners at no additional cost. Sign up at SoFi.com slash Richard Lives to get started with a financial planner today. So, Brett, today we've talked a lot about your career, but I want to pivot to your personal life, the love of your life, Gary, mm -hmm. Gare Bear. No, he's going to hate that. I'm not going to say that. He will hate that. <laughs> But I'd love to ask a little bit about how you guys split your finances. Um, both of you are in the creative industry and money isn't necessarily the same as it is with people who just work W-2 jobs at corporations. Mm -hmm. At any given time, you could be making a ton, Gary's not making as much, there's another time that Gary could be making a ton, you're not making as much. Like, How do you guys balance finances when the income isn't consistent? The one of the great things about being with somebody for over 22 years is that you, like for us, it's not even a conversation. Mm. Like we kind of just pick up for the other person without really discussing it. You know, yeah. it's just things kind of, we know when things are ebbing and flowing. We're obviously aware of when one person's busier than the other, but both of us also wear a lot of different hats. You know, Gary writes for TV, but he also writes books and yeah. he also now tours and I have TV and styling and the other things that I do. So we're both kind of juggling a lot of things at the same time. And when one person is, you know, the goal is obviously that we're earning a lot at the same time. But as you said, sometimes that doesn't happen. And when that doesn't happen, you know, we just pick up for the other person and just, you know, it ebbs and flows, and that's a true partnership as well. We actually joke about it. We'll be like, I'll Venmo you uh, 20 <laughs> bucks for dinner tonight, you know, or whatever. But um, that's like not a thing with us. I order him stuff and buy him stuff for whatever that he likes like one designer. So I look for it on sale for him and I buy him things. And it's not like I'm like, so you owe me $600 for that <laughs> shirt. It's like everything just kind of like evens out. Like it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. What would you say each of your guys is like, finance style is. So like, for example, I'm the saver in my relationship and my fiance is like the spender. I can't say either of us are major savers, <laughs> but I will say Gary is the retail shopper and okay. I'm the discount shopper. Okay. Like, I like that. Even at the grocery store, like I'm looking for the, the Two dollars off, yeah. one dollar off. Buy seven yogurts, get one free. Yeah, oh, <laughs> you're speaking my language. Gary <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, is yeah. just like go in and buy what he needs. Mm -hmm. He was buying from this one store, this one designer for a little bit, and I'm like, "Can you please let me get a discount for us, yeah. please?" And then you can shop on my discount, but let, I know I can get a discount for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And so now he shops on the discount, which nice. is nice. So that's kind of where we differ. He's like, mm -hmm. he's like a see now, buy now. Okay. And I'm like, see now, wait for four months, and then an extra Compare 10%. Compare eight different websites, Correct. see yeah. where I can Fill get the Fill up the car, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it carried forward from the back to school shopping. I mean, similar theme. It does, yeah. yeah, it definitely does. And so has the hiding the credit card statements that we used to do for my mom. Yeah. Really? Wait, oh, can yeah. you tell us about that? Well, part of the deal was we would be able to go and buy what we want to on sale. Yeah. But the, <laughs> my mom's going to be like, why did you tell this story? But the clothes <laughs> would stay in the trunk until my dad wasn't home. And then we would bring the clothes inside to our rooms. And then the next step was we were to keep an eye on the mailbox for the credit card receipts so that my mom could see the credit card receipt first and then tell my dad about how much it was. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So there was no fashion show in your living room like there was in mine where I had to put on every article of clothing I had purchased and my dad had to pretend like he cared. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'll happily come over and be your dad for you. I love a fashion show in your living room. That would be major. Nice. But we, we do that for my daughter, by the way. Yeah, of course. So That's pretty awesome. And yeah. you have to hype her up. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Now, one of the things I, I was reading about is you and Gary started in different stages in your career when you got together. Yes. I guess, how is the, that dynamic change, managing money together then versus now? Well, then versus now, I wasn't managing a ton of money because um, I also was coming from Canada. So there was a window of time in which 
I was on visas that wouldn't allow me to work. Mm. Um, and so there was that. But what happened was I always wanted to have my independent life. I always wanted to have my own money. I always wanted to make my own money. And that was also kind of a requirement early on in our relationship was the fact that we were in two different spots in our lives and that in order for it to work, which clearly it has, I needed to have my own independent life financially and also my own independent life outside of his. Um, meaning like my own friend group, like not to just kind of attach myself to a life that was already set up, which is easy to do when you're moving from yeah. another country to, um, I know it's like it's Canada, but it's still another country, <laughs> um, to, you know, LA. And so what that did though, was it made me, when I started making my own money, obviously then I was super happy to be contributing to our lives and being able to pay back, not, in a way of like, there was a tally, but be able to buy him clothes and to be able to like take him on a trip and like do all of these things, which has, you know, only enriched our lives to the point now we, you know, live in a house that we've renovated together, that we did together, that we both love. So now with the, the ebb and flow, I think what we always wanted was, and I always wanted for myself was to have my own successful business, you know, mm -hmm. and to have my own successful life independent of him that we could join together and make our life together, um, which to me is a true partnership in every sense of the word. And I, I will say, you know, Gary was also such a champion of me really going after my dreams, you know, like not settling, always kind of like, trying to get to the place that I wanted to go, you know, and to push through a lot of really hard times. Um, I couldn't ask for a better partner in any sense of the word. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I'm very lucky that I've had somebody who has encouraged me to be as big as I possibly can, you know, and to like claim my space in the world as much as I can. Yeah. And it, it's so interesting that you talk about like, the communication to say, okay, have my own life and then financially, because earlier you mentioned like, hey, we don't even need to talk. So right. We know kind of what's going on. So I was like, okay, there must have been really solid communication on the front end to get to that point. Yeah, and I think it continues to change too, because, um, you know, it's also like we're both grown men, you know, we can spend like, he can spend, I'm not going to say like, oh, you really shouldn't have bought that blankety blank. Like he's a grown man, mm -hmm. you know, he can spend his money how he wants to spend his money. I can spend mine how I want to spend mine, you know, but at the end of the day, we're always thinking of the greater good of us and our household and our future. And if that means in the interim, like I want to buy a cashmere sweater, then I'm not, I don't go downstairs and be like, hey, can I buy a sweater? Like I have a job, <laughs> you know, like I can buy the stuff that I want, you know. It, how do you manage that infrastructure? Is it like you've got a yours, mine and ours account? Correct. Or, oh, okay. So yeah. you like the three account. Well, Correct. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have, we both have our separate business accounts uh -huh. and then we have like a joint like household account kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it all, I mean, we always joke like it all goes to the same place like yeah. you know it all comes in and goes out to the same places but we definitely have things set up together but then also our own separate money generators mm. yeah i love that yeah so it's kind of funny i would say i tend to be more of a spender and my wife really, is more Brian? of a saver yeah. i was not expecting that me yeah. either so i i don't spend money on very many things but if i want something I buy it. Yeah. I'm but the then I, I, I save money or I don't spend money across the board. And hmm. then, yeah. So strategic spender, I suppose. Yeah. But my yeah. wife's naturally a saver. Oh, yeah. must be nice. Yeah. Same. It is very nice. Are you a natural? Sa you're yes. not. You're a natural saver? Yeah. Really? I really am. What's the mindset? Are you like saving for a disaster or are you just saving because it feels good? I think it's a little bit of both, right? Like, I grew up and my parents were Chinese immigrants. So it, it was a little bit of like always feeling like the other shoe was gonna drop. Mm -hmm. So that saving gives you that sense of stability and security. And I'm not saying like, you know, obviously as I've gotten more senior in my career and made more money year after year, like I'm not taking the subway at 11.30 PM at night. Right. I'm calling the Uber and that's okay. But I would say 
The very first designer bag I bought when I started my career on Wall Street, nothing has ever felt as good as mm. that bag because that bag represented all that hard work. Mm -hmm. But now I think I would rather save that money instead of buying a piece at retail and you know think about, hey, do I want to get a vacation home? Do I right. want to buy something that's going to actually potentially appreciate in value versus something that I might wear for a season or two and then it'll just getting you know, get pushed to the back of my closet. I'm also kind of of the mindset, like you never know where life is gonna take you. So like yeah. buy the bag, buy the walk, like buy the thing that's gonna make you happy unless you have like, you know, a, you're a hoarder. But like, if you're like been looking at a necklace or like a pair of shoes or something that you're like, you don't know if you should buy, like just buy them, mm. like buy them. Like who knows what's around the corner? Who knows what like, tomorrow brings, like buy the shoes, enjoy the shoes, go mm -hmm. out dancing in them, go have a fun time, go out for dinner with your girlfriends, make everybody look at them, turn some heads, like <laughs> have some fun, have some fun. I like that. See, and like be a spender, it's not on shoes or clothes or anything like that. That's my natural personality. So I kind of have to trick myself into doing the right things. Mm -hmm. Like my wife is in charge of our day-to-day -day finances. We automate all of our savings. So then basically whatever's left over, Fun money. Yeah. I want jet skis next summer. I'm gonna buy them. Thick. I love yeah. a jet ski. So it's like stuff like that. Um, but it's kind of like putting that system in place because naturally I didn't have that in my early to mid twenties and that was not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah trust me. Hiding oh. my hiding my tip money from being a bartender in an envelope. And then I'd be like, 20, 40, 60, 81, 20, 40, 60, 82, <laughs> 20, 40, 60, 83. Like, what can I do this weekend? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spend it all. <laughs> actually, no, I actually, I actually saved it all. Oh, really? Yeah. I was like prepping for like a 23 year old's doomsday. Actually, I was preparing to go to Greece. Um, so I was saving all of my money and, uh, I, that's where I met Gary. Wow. Like I was saving all my money to go to Greece. I'd never been out of Canada before. I'd been to Florida, but not to Europe. And I went that by myself and I know Naples, my grandparents had a house in Naples. Um, but yeah, I saved all that money and then I like got on a plane and I went to Greece and I met Gary at the end of my trip That's and then my life like changed forever. So save your money. kids. <laughs> what a meet cute. I love yeah. that. Brad, thank you so much for chatting with us today. I also really appreciated the laughs and all of your wisdom and we loved having you. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. Yeah. Thank you. That was pretty eye-opening, and now I'm starting to understand a little bit more why I see people spend so much money on clothes. Okay, so do you want to tell the viewers at home to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel, or should I? I think you just did, but while you're at it, you could follow SoFi on TikTok. Okay, then I think we're good then. See you next time. Hi, it's me, Brian Walsh, AKA Dr. Money, again, to talk about some of the legal stuff. Though I am a certified financial planner professional, your finances are unique. That means anything I talked about today shouldn't be considered advice. Think of it more as high level education or guidance. And don't forget to subscribe. Camo Crocs, floral tops, oh like, oh god. my god. I looked at the wrong camera. Which camera are we looking at? <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. I'm gross.